All right, we were, we were talking coming in. This is the sixth out of the seventh. Can you believe it? We have been uh, at this now for a um, serious amount of time. So welcome to the sixth session. Each time we say this will be one that you won't forget, well, this will be one you won't forget uh, with who I'm about to introduce speaking and then the panel that will be following Mike um, as we go uh, forward. Um, toward the end of the session, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, interesting, uh, some, several in, I'm trying to look who all was on the trip. I see Pete's not here yet. Uh, anyway, we're on the chamber uh, inner city visit to Vancouver, British Columbia this past week. At the same time we were there, the Urban Land Institute had its major meeting out there. And Mike was uh, involved in the Urban Land Institute sessions. In fact, as speakers came and talked and met with us, they would say, well, we just left uh, the ULI and we saw some folks that knew you from at the ULI. So we had a good time. So we'll spend some time uh, now. Uh, Pete's here too. We'll spend some time toward the end talking about that. One quick update before um, I introduce Mike to you. Um, I know we're all in various ways tracking what's going on in the General Assembly with regard to the AMP. Um, and we've talked about that several times. Um, the, the, the saga continues. Um, as of about an hour ago, and this may get updated at any moment, if you get a text or somebody's watching it for you, let us know. Um, but um, as of about an hour ago, uh, conferees had been appointed by the Senate and by the House for a conference committee to resolve the two versions of the legislation. Uh, the Senate version being the one that basically bans BRT on um, state routes in a metropolitan area, i.e. Nashville. The House version is the one that sort of reinforced a consultative process on BRT, which really didn't change anything. And obviously it was uh, those of us uh, that don't want to see them interfering, it, it was the one we would prefer. Um, the scary thing now is conference committees at the end of the session can happen really fast. I mean, normally, in many cases, they don't even go to a meeting room. They just get in the hall. And if the speakers have come up with a deal, then, and, and they've appointed the conferees to be obviously their appointees, then the conferees will get together and do what the speakers told them to do and the deal will get made and they'll go right back in and it'll go on the floor as a report from the conference committee and then each house just votes up or down the conference report. There's no amending or anything that goes on. So if you think about it, it can happen slam bang. I mean, it can be just bang, bang, bang and it's done. Uh, the, the negative here is that one of the amendments that is in that, that apparently will be a part of that conference committee uh, discussion. One amendment will basically say, well, we, uh, all, what we, won't, we won't mandate no BRT, but we will uh, uh, require that the legislature be involved in the review process for any BRT project in the state of Tennessee. And in a conference environment, that can be sold as less restrictive than the Senate version, and it could, that could come out. I, I'm feeling from people watching it a little pessimism right now, uh, but that could come out. There actually was one that said, there was one out there, we were talking earlier, I remember, uh, that got on, uh, I think, Wired in some places that basically said uh, there will be no BRT on state routes anywhere in the state of Tennessee. Just put it out that way. So this is all still in play. Um, there is absolutely no question that there's uh, the, um, the uh, Americans for Progress, uh, the Koch brothers are involved. Uh, Lee Beeman has been in the middle of everything going on. Saw a picture today of all of them huddled. And it's just, it's, this whole issue has been moved into a political environment that, uh, that's kind of gone well beyond uh, the transit issues involved. But you know what? There are people that understand things like this. And I'm a <laughs> or tell you it can't be understood. Yeah, it's my privilege to introduce to you Mike Saint. Um, I won't spend time. You'll get Mike's background after you, uh, as you listen to what Mike has to say. You have his presentation. Um, Mike heads up Saint Consulting, which is a, a land use uh, and a project type consulting firm. He'll tell you more about that. Located right here in Middle Tennessee, uh, with clients all over the world. Um, uh, Mike is uh, a, a known speaker at university, particularly in the real estate world, uh, where the issue of getting permission to do things and dealing with local opposition uh, is, is of concern. Mike is one of those experts that's brought in to talk about that. And it's just been a delight to have him 
uh, and be willing to work with us as we've put the academy together. He's spoken previously and uh, once again graciously with his travel schedule. If you ever call Mike, you never know where you're going to find him. Um, I've found him in Hawaii. I found him on a, what was it, a train or a plane going to Vancouver. I don't remember. Anyway, all over the place. Uh, but it's a privilege for us to have Mike with us. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you Mike Zane. Thank you all. Uh, there's a clicker somewhere that to move the. Okay. Can you all hear me? Yeah. I'm going to talk fast. I'm both got a lot to cover, and I'm a Yankee. I've grown up in uh, Massachusetts. I've lived here since 95, but we all talk fast up north, you may know. Um, so. The top button will move forward. Okay, I'm here to tell you that despite your project's return on its investment and its beauty beautiful architecture and engineering and its uh, jobs and taxes and all the benefits your project that you care about, even if it's a project that is proposed by the government, that project will fail because technology doesn't work. <laughs> because there are NIMBYs out there waiting to get you. They do not want your project, and that's what we're here to talk about. And what you have to do to overcome the dozens, hundreds, thousands that show up with signs and petitions saying, I don't want your lousy project. So after I've been doing this since 1984, uh, 30 years more than 1,800 projects in 48 states, Canada, and the UK. And I see the same thing over and over and over again. People say, your project's going to hurt me. I don't want it. And they politically organize. So here's our core belief after all those projects. And that is that all permission for new land use development is political. The political decision makers, whether they're the state reps, senators on conference committee that Ed just spoke about, or the city council, or the county commission, whoever has jurisdiction to vote, they don't care, no offense to any elected officials here, about your projects, benefits, beauty, architecture, engineering. What they are sensitive to are phone calls and other demonstrations from their voters that if they vote for it, they will not be reelected or they will not get their next job running for a higher office because those people will turn out. Local politicians hate to make decisions on anything to do with land use because they get more feedback, mostly negative, about decisions on everything from a two-family house in a one-family house district to a oil refinery worth $12 billion to a gambling casino to a uh, commuter railroad. They get more feedback about those things than anything they, else they do as elected officials. And they hate it because it's a no-win situation. If 60% of the people in the district from where that city council or, or state rep are from are opposed to something and they vote no, those 40% will be very angry at them in the next election. It's a no-win situation, so they don't want to make those decisions. To win land use fights over anything, you have to take your project and consider it a candidate. It's not a, a political candidate in the <coughs> conventional sense, but it is a candidate. You have to run a political campaign to get that project approved by the, the uh, local elected officials who will otherwise think everybody is against it. 
So how do I know this? I've been doing it for, as I said, 31 years, 1,800 projects. I've got offices in here and in Massachusetts and California and Hawaii. Uh, we only do land use projects. We're always working on dozens of them at the same time. Uh, we hire people who came out of running political campaigns, figuring they'd be the best to run, design and run a successful political campaign for a project. And then we train them about land use and zoning and environmental laws and regulations, so they're very skilled and knowledgeable about the, the kinds of battles that they will go in. And then we keep stealing. I'm always a big fan of stealing. Um, <laughs> political campaign tactics and the latest in, um, IT tools from political campaigns where Obama or Bush have spent zillions developing new databases or new uh, electronic uh, micro-targeting systems, whatever. We just go grab those and use them for our clients to um, build a successful political campaign for their project. Um, our projects have included an oil refinery in uh, South Dakota, a gambling casino, $1.3 billion resort style gambling casino in Massachusetts, a $2 billion, 3,500 uh, single family home project in Hawaii, uh, uh, 1,200 mile gas pipeline, multiple uh, retail residential mixed use developments all over the place. Uh, uh, potash mines, gold mines, uh, landfills. Uh, if it's a use of the land and it needs new permits, it will be controversial and we've probably done one or 20. Um, so even when you have a project supported by government, you need to build political support, especially then. And but you can't do it the conventional way. If you're Steve Wynn and you hire <coughs> Mike Saint in Massachusetts to build support for a referendum campaign to approve your $1.3 billion casino, uh, you just write him checks. But government doesn't have that wherewithal nor the process to allow it to just go out and hire someone to organize public support. So in order to do that, there needs to be public-private partnerships, and I'll tell you more about that in a while, but um, you need to get people who will benefit from the project, who support the project for whatever reason, to pony up to build support. Otherwise, it'll all be negative signs saying stop or no or not here. So let me tell you uh, a couple of, of quick war stories. There was once uh, years ago uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, home of Harvard and MIT, a citizens group uh, called Citizens for Livable Neighborhoods who did not want new development, even though Cambridge is a um, target for high-tech and biotech development had over 90,000 people drove into the city every day to work in high-tech and biotech jobs, they needed to park. So what this group said was to stop development, we will announce that we are against the environmental damage being caused by all the cars driving into our city. And so the way to stop cars from driving into the city is to uh, prohibit them to park by not having enough parking spaces. So they argued that the city council um, vote to enact an ordinance that would have prohibited the construction of any new parking spaces <coughs> in the city of Cambridge. 90,000 population, 90,000 people coming in every day to work there who didn't live there. And um, that, um, they said, well, if people can't drive into the city, they won't bring their cars polluting our air. Never mind that most of the air the people in Cambridge breathes has nothing to do with cars driving in or through the city. So um, had this ordinance passed, it would have prohibited any new parking. You couldn't build a Harvard classroom building. Oh, you could, but you couldn't have parking for Nobel Prize winning professors at Harvard. 
you could build a uh, supermarket, but you couldn't have parking for the customers. You could build a office building, but you couldn't have parking for the tenants. So no new parking for any kind of non-residential use. So during the course of a year, the citizens group, about 24 strong, uh, had campaigned heavily with the city council, which was, like in most college towns, a very, very, very liberal, progressive, whatever term you want to use, council, who said, oh yeah, we, we're in favor of clean air, let's ban parking. Five of the nine council members, enough to create the ordinance, promised they would vote to ban parking, new parking in Cambridge. So we ran a political campaign to protect the rights of developers and institutions in the city to add parking spaces to meet their growing needs. The night of the vote at city council chamber, we had 300 people in the hall, uh, 20 of those were the citizens for livable neighborhoods who had been showing up every week for a year. And the rest were people we organized who were against the parking freeze. And you knew they were against the parking freeze because they were all wearing buttons that said, melt the freeze. And no mistake whose side they were on. They were little old Portuguese ladies from East Cambridge. They were local 40 union carpenters. They were steel workers. They were white collar employees from Polaroid and from uh, uh, Lotus Computers and a number of other major companies that had uh, business in the city. And the mayor looked out, and the mayor was the chairman of the city council, one of the nine elected. She looked out and she called a recess. And she went into the back room with the head of our citizens group. And she said, David, I'm not gonna vote with all those people out there let's get together next week and work out a compromise. And they did. And no one was ever blocked from building Genzyme's World LEED certified uh, headquarters building or anything else because they couldn't get parking space permits. But it was a lesson to us that no matter what they say in the back room, no matter what their political ideology is, if they see enough real voters in their face, they will vote with the real voters. And so our job as proponents of a particular project, our job meaning you, is to find real people who live in the community and get them to participate in the political process. Um, crowd size does make a difference. If you have 300 and they have 20, you're gonna win 90% of the time. Um, email, getting your people to send emails and letters are good, uh, particularly if they're not prefabricated um, boilerplate postcards that politician gets 50 that all say the same thing. He knows it's, a, it's not the people, it's some organized group trying to promote it. So you gotta get individual letters, individual emails. Uh, and they're better. Uh, newspaper ads help. Uh, we've run ads, full page ads in the local paper signed by 2,000 people who were in support of our project saying they were in support of the project. And when you're a local politician, you know those people. You may not know them all by name, but you know that person lives on 12 Elm Street and they probably voted for me. Um, petitions are better than newspaper ads because it's, it's signed documents that come to them. Uh, and crowds getting to go to public meetings are even more powerful and better. And finally, one-on-one uh, -on -one voter contact is the best. If you can get real people who vote there to show up and vote um, uh, by talking one-on-one -on -one with their elected official, it will have a major impact. Again, most of these council members may vote on a million things a year, and only a couple of, of land use issues will get people to call them. A, a zillion dollar city budget that they vote on will not produce the phone calls and, and voter impact that a, a zoning matter will have. So that's what you need to do. Now, some other lessons from 31 years. Um, all, as I said, all land use is political. 
We have worked in London, England, London, Kentucky, London, Ontario, Canada. The governments there are totally different. The re regulations regulating new land use are totally different. It's called planning permission, not zoning, in, in the UK, for instance. And it's, it's mandated by parliament, not by the local city, but the city has to implement the parliamentary law. But it doesn't matter, because each place, the final decision is made by a locally elected official who is more worried about the, vote, the ramifications the political ramifications of voting yes or no than they are about anything else having to do with the project. Most of the time you will find um, that planning staffs will do a, a tremendous job of putting together all the facts and figures and documents and site plans and traffic studies and produce this amount of paper for one project. Politicians don't read it. They pay attention to five phone calls that came to their house from neighbors saying, don't you dare approve that project. Um, the political climate's worsening. We do polling, and we'll, I'll talk about this more in a minute, uh, called the St. Index National Poll. What do you think of development? Are you for or against? And, and what kind of development would aggravate you most, cause you most to go out and, and uh, put up a sign? And um, our latest poll showed 70 Nine percent of Americans say they want nothing new built in their community. Nothing. I like my town just the way it is. Don't go messing with it by putting in something that's not there now. There are four kinds of opposition to real estate projects. It doesn't matter whether it's a, a bus rapid transit system or a a gold mine or a office park or a hospital. Four kinds of opposition. Number one are NIMBYs, not in my backyard. They are people who are afraid your project will hurt them. They think, because someone told them, that it will pollute their air or it will uh, cause traffic gridlock in front of their house or it will attract undesirable people, we all know what that means, to their neighborhood to rob them. Um, or it will um, block their view or lower their property value. And most of the time, the people who oppose projects are homeowners, and their single biggest investment is their home, and they're scared to death that if you put in a affordable housing up the street or a Walmart that's going to create a lot of traffic, you are, or you block their left turn out of their neighborhood, you are going to lower their property value. And so they are scared about your project. So that's NIMBY. Second, in many states, labor unions play a role in fighting new real estate development projects. Sometimes they fight in favor, and I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But the uh, labor unions, not only the building trades, in states where uh, building trades have a lot of sway, like Massachusetts, California, they will, will try to squeeze the developer by uh, opposing the project until they get a contract for the jobs that they want for their members. It's an economic play. Or if they are SEIU um, and they represent hospitals and you're trying to build a hospital that's not union and there's already a union hospital in town represented by SEIU, they will fight to stop your project so you won't uh, cause economic harm to one of their union's employers. The uh, next type of opposition is competitors. And competitors are not just who you think. Competitors can be, you know, you've got uh, Kroger and you're doing real well and the Publix wants to go across the street. That's a competitor. They will lower your um, revenue and profit if they open up. So it's more uh, um, economic for you to, to spend some money, hire lawyers, help the neighbors to fight the new guy and protect your profits. So it's an economic play. And then finally is the ideological play and that's the um, people who believe in a cause, whether it's preservation or environmental protection or whatever, 
who don't think your project is appropriate for whatever reason. We were working, I mentioned the oil refinery in South Dakota. We had our share of NIMBYs, but we also had Sierra Club people flying in from San Francisco to South Dakota every weekend to campaign against an oil refinery that they said the people in South Dakota shouldn't be allowed to have. So you get, and uh, there are battles um, in Hawaii over genetically modified crops on agricultural land, and those fights are being funded by a um, nonprofit from Minnesota that doesn't believe in genetically modified crops. And the locals are participating in the, in the battle to zone out the ability of the farmers and the seed companies from growing genetically modified corn seed, but the, the money is coming from somewhere else, and that often happens in these campaigns. Uh, opponents, whether they are, have an economic motive or a, a emotional driven NIMBY or a, um, someone who has uh, um, some other uh, uh, ideological cause, they are emotional. And that emotion causes them to be politically passionate. It doesn't take much encouragement to get any of those groups who feel threatened to put up a sign that says, not here. Don't allow it. Don't want it. It doesn't take much encouragement to get those people to run down to City Hall and pack a hearing room and scream at the proponent of your project. It does take a lot of effort to get supporters to turn out. And the reason is that most supporters are not threatened economically or ideologically by the project and have come to the conclusion it's a good idea. Hey, we, we could use it on the mall. Yeah, bring it on. Let me know when it's open. I'll shop there. But they don't come to City Hall and say, vote for this. So the room fills up with 300 no's and two guys with coat and tie from out of town saying, please approve the project. Well, if you're a city council member and you're about to get re, be in a re-election campaign, whose side are you going to be on? The 300 voters or the two guys from out of town who don't vote there? Old approaches to getting projects approved included going to lunch with the mayor smoking a scar with a building inspector and you walk out with your permits. Doesn't happen anymore. The old approaches included hiring the mayor's former political campaign manager to set up a round of lunches. Doesn't work anymore. It's all about head counting now. And, if, and, it, and just in, in London, England, the same thing. London, Ontario, the same thing. They're worried that if they anger too many of their voters, they won't have a political career. Um, so you need, even the government-backed projects need to organize political support. And, and that's particularly true um, these days. There was a, uh, I'm not going to talk about the local cause, I promised I wouldn't. But um, the, uh, and I don't have a dog in, in that fight, but um, the uh, Atlanta, a couple summers ago, had a referendum for seven or eight billion dollar uh, construction of new roads, new mass transit, um, increase in the sales tax to pay for that package, support of the Democratic governor, I mean the uh, mayor of Atlanta and the Republican governor of Georgia. They got beat 62 to 38 in the referendum by a group that included the Tea Party, we don't want any public money spent and taxes raised, and by a group that included the Sierra Club. There's not enough public transit in this bill. We're not going to support it. So independent groups out there organizing, and politics does make strange bedfellows. They organized a terrific campaign, and the, the people in favor didn't organize a a strong campaign. Didn't organize much of campaign at all, apparently. So you've got to treat your project as if it were a candidate running for office, and you've got to do everything that the people 
organizing the uh, Obama for President campaign or the Cooper for Congress campaign or whatever would do to get their person elected. Know who is going to support you, get their names, addresses, phone numbers, and get them to participate in the political process. If it's a referendum, it's get them to show up on election day. If it's a um, city council meeting, it's getting those people who you know to be on your side to get up and go down to City Hall the night of the hearing and say so. So, um, I did that one. Um, as I mentioned, we did St. Index, and I'll move <coughs> quickly through that, but St. Index has been around since 2005. We poll a thousand across the country by phone, ask them a whole lot of questions um, about what they support, what they oppose, and why. We have a, a pretty good understanding demographically of who will oppose a project. It's usually homeowners. The political party affiliation doesn't matter. It's not Republican or Democrat. It's um, often politically moderate people who own homes, who have $100,000 a year family income, who, um, who have a college degree or better. I mean, these are, are smart, uh, well-educated, um, uh, well-funded people who are afraid your project will hurt them and they are very influential because they all vote and they organize and they pay for lawyers to file appeals. We we're down in Boca Raton one time talking to a guy who wanted to build a condo tower and he had a condo tower next door that in one weekend raised $600,000 to oppose his project because the, the, the condos in the, the building next door who were afraid their views would be blocked were owned by people, two billionaires and a whole bunch of millionaires, and the average condo price in the building was five million. Unspoken, but you know. But it's still, they raised that money just like that to fight. And when they lost politically, they went into court. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, rail. We we poll, poll rail. We haven't polled uh, bus rapid transit systems, but um, <coughs> strong opinions on both sides. And and I tell people that I have a blog called Saint Report, and I write about things having to do with land use. And I have done projects in Maui. I've done projects on Cape Cod. I've done projects in San Francisco. All of those are very hard places to get new things built and approved. But the hardest land use is not a project in the middle of a fancy community. The hardest project is linear land use, long, thin lines that go through multiple jurisdictions like bus routes, rail lines, power lines, 1,200 mile long gas pipelines, because everywhere along the line, there are political um, agencies that have to be satisfied. There are political people who can op oppose the project in different jurisdictions along the way. And there's very little you can say to the people on a 1,200-mile pipeline, you in mile 27 are going to get these great benefits if you allow the pipe to go through your community where I can say, oh, you're building a new shopping center well, or a new supermarket. Well, we'll have 45 kinds of all-natural yogurt. And I'm, I have things I can talk about. We're going to have 300 jobs in your community. We're going to have um, 400000 a year in new taxes that we can pay to your community. We were doing a, a rock quarry. I don't know. Anybody here been to a rock quarry? It's OK. So you know. It's blasting. It's truck trips, it's um, not too many jobs because it's highly automated these days. And it's going to be there 50 years if the engineers did a good job finding the deposit of whatever they're going to quarry. There's not much you can say to people, oh, come support our quarry, you'll, you know, 45 kinds of yogurt will be on <laughs> sale when you build it. It doesn't happen. But what we did find was that quarry would pay $400,000 a year into the city school, into the county school tax under Texas law, it was outside Austin. And the school 
uh, system was broke. We went to the superintendent and said, we're going to give you 400000 a year in new taxes, and we're not going to give you any new kids to educate because there aren't any kids going to live at the quarry. And he said, what can I do to help? I, I need teacher raises. I need new books. 400000 would go a long way to helping. What do you want me to do? We said, Parent Teachers Association. <laughs> the Parent Teachers Association became the nucleus of a grassroots group going to public hearings, demanding that the quarry be approved, not because they were going to work there, live there, shop there, uh, or you know anything. It was because they wanted the indirect benefit of 400000 in new tax dollars coming to help their schools. So it's always about finding people and getting them to participate in the process. Well, in um, rail and in long, thin lines, it's hard to find that. Right? So um, the opponents are, are unified, often well-funded. We've talked about uh, organizations that pop up uh, often because they have an economic interest. So uh, I'm going to talk in a minute about Hawaii, where we did the rail, a referendum for rail. But the major opponents, anybody want to guess who was opposed to a 17-mile long light rail uh, rapid transit system, the first rapid transit in the city of Honolulu has horrible, horrible, horrible traffic. You want to guess who the opponents were funded by? Tourist industry? No, the tourist industry liked it. But good guess, it was the limo drivers, the taxi drivers, sure. the gas station owners. None of them wanted, and by people who were opposed to using tax dollars for new funding. Now this. Uh, I'll, I'll get into that in a minute, but um, so opponents to things like rail um, uh, have can be very well organized, very well funded, and if there's no one on the other side, all the politicians are going to hear is stop, no, don't, and never, yes, please, that's important to us. So the, you plan a, a campaign like you were running that rail for office. You find the messages that resonate with the people who live and vote in that area. And you push those messages. You reach out to those people. And you uh, explain to them. And we're going to talk about the advocacy pyramid in a minute. I'm falling behind here. Um, OK. and. Um, and you get them to agree to participate in the political process, whether it's show up on election day if it's a referendum, or show up at the city council public hearings. And then when the time comes, you make sure you are organized to go into that database of all those people who said they're in favor and get them to do what they said, which was put up a lawn sign, make a phone call, send out an email, show up at the public hearing. In general, more people have worked to stop something in their community than have worked to, to help it get built. And, and that number, 14%, the first time we did it was like about six. It's only in the last few years where people like you, developers and project proponents, have realized that they've got to get supporters engaged, have people actually started to turn out. But the, if left to their own devices, more people will show up against them, will show up in favor. So you have, to, you have to take that into consideration as you build your campaign in favor of your project. <coughs> I mentioned this already, in a way. Um, people say they're opposed to environmental, for environmental reasons, or crime reasons, or public safety reasons. but. The people who are more apt to uh, oppose a project are homeowners, not renters. And that means that they're really concerned about their um, property values. Or they have a business or some other organization that will lose money. But it, it's always, they'll always find some reason that doesn't sound selfish. A NIMBY, I'm talking about, not a competitor, not a union, not an environmental 
activist, but a NIMBY will find, will try to say something that doesn't make them sound as the most selfish person who ever lived. You know, I'm in favor of affordable housing, just that's not a good location for it. Uh, I'm in favor of wind farms, so we, we need them, we, we've got global warming, we need wind farms. But, you know, putting it here where all the wind is isn't such a good idea, it's close to my house and it will keep me awake all night. But in the end, they're protecting their interests, their economic interests or their ideological interests. So specifically about rail, and, and I think in a way these numbers, all, although as I said, I haven't polled BRTs or other kind or trolley systems, but um, people, they're long thin lines of, of mass transit and people have the same sort of take on them. Um, the most likely opponents and the most likely supporters. Again, it, the, um, that gives you a, a, a sense, but um, if it doesn't stop in their neighborhood, it doesn't stop in their town, you know, out in California they're doing the, the uh, high speed rail from LA to San Francisco and it's going through vast acreage of, of communities where there's no stop, those people are against. What, what's in it for me? You're going to have a train whistling through here every 30 minutes and I can't get on it because I'm 5 miles or 15 miles or 40 miles from the nearest station. So they oppose. People over 65 are opposed as well. Those are because that's the age group who grew up when they had to yeah, but that's, they won't want change generally. And, but I mean, that's a, a couple of years old and it's, it's a general across the board number. If you start to pin down, you find out that college educated people who used to take the train to work are in favor of, of rail, but even if they're 72. But in general, um, people who have lived a long time and are very happy with their life right now don't want change for any kind of, 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 of deal. Um, and the numbers are pretty um, heavy. It, um, if the train stops in your community, they're going to be in favor. All right, so we talk about Honolulu. Um, Mayor Mufi Hunneman, back about um, oh, five or six years ago, went out and got federal money, state money, and, and needed to get a referendum approval to city money to build a 17 mile long commuter rail, light rail, with lots of stops through downtown Honolulu, um, running from uh, the edge of Waikiki, if, if you've been to Waikiki. Honolulu, and all the way out into the northern, towards the northern suburbs. Um, he thought it was a slam dunk. Mufi, interesting Democratic uh, politician, Native Hawaiian, Mormon, because they have a large Mormon con uh, contingent in Hawaii. Um, some days popular, some days not popular as mayor, as they all, as all mayors are. Um, he thought it was, you know, a, a no-brainer. And the labor unions, which are very powerful and very strong, the building trades labor unions, had all endorsed the project. He said, what's the problem? And then the other side began to organize. The, as I said, the limo drivers and the taxi drivers and the, the other people who felt threatened by a commuter rail. And uh, all of a sudden, someone did a poll, I think it was the uh, Star Bulletin paper, and it was uh, two points against approval. And they had all the federal money, which isn't true in Nashville, and they had all the state money that they needed. Uh, and, and a lot more expensive than the seven mile long Nashville BRT. They had it all except a small token of city money, and people are against it. 
so they called us and, and in to, to organize because they hadn't been organizing like they were running a candidate for, for Congress or mayor. They had just been saying, hey, it's great. We're going to have, we're going to have rail. We did a significant um, polling. Um, we wanted to understand who was likely to support it, who was likely to oppose it, because we couldn't go to every home. There are, uh, I think, uh, I want to say about 800,000 people in Oahu. Um, and they all got to vote, and there wasn't time to go knock on all those doors. So who was likely to support it and why? And then we'll go to the neighborhoods that have a lot of those people and encourage them to, to, to come out. Um, so here's what our polling data found, that people were sort of mystified by the process. They didn't really understand what was going on, so they couldn't get their hands around why they should vote yes or no. The perfect supporter was a young, employed male of Filipino heritage. If you don't know Hawaii, about 75% of the people who are, are um, citizens in Hawaii are of Asian descent. They came from China or Japan, 37% from Japan, the Philippines um, from Polynesia, all the native Hawaiians of whom there are not many left, are of Polynesian heritage. But, and they've all intermarried, so there's mixed. I had a woman who was working for me who was one quarter Portuguese, one quarter Japanese, one quarter Filipino, and one quarter Hawaiian. Um, so very mixed heritage. But if you could find young Filipinos, for some reason, they were re very much in, into the idea of um, a train, and so we spent a lot of time in the neighborhood, the Filipino neighborhoods, educating them and getting them to show up on election day. Um, you have to test your messages. It's easy to say, oh, everybody's in favor of mass transit, but that's not always true, and it may be that their definition of mass transit isn't the same. Housing, for instance, you could say, we're, we're not doing affordable housing, we're doing workforce housing. Well, if you say affordable housing, people immediately conjure up public housing projects of Chicago gangsters and, and say, well, we don't want that here. Or if you say workforce housing, they say, what are you talking about? I don't know what that is. You say to them, no, we're building homes, not houses, homes that regular people like carpenters and policemen can afford. Then you get them, but it's finding the right message to reach them, and then pounding away at that message with all of your media, digital media, Facebook, web pages, email, blasts. And, um, but you've got to understand what the opposition is saying. Is the opposition saying that uh, this shouldn't happen because, then we need to have a good response to that in our campaign, the same way you would do if you were running a campaign for a congressman. And the other side said, oh, he beats his wife. Well, we need to deal with that issue quickly and out front. Otherwise, everybody in town will believe that lie that he beats his wife. The. Uh, So a couple of takeaways. Most important, if you don't do your polling and understand the messages and who's going to support you, you're not going to win. Second is um, you've got to make sure people understand what they're voting for and why they, if they believe what you believe, that they should vote your way on the ballot, not avoid the question, not not vote, and not vote no because they don't really understand it. To build support, and this again, it was a referendum, it wasn't a, a, a city council vote at this point. We knocked on 12,000 doors. We made 6,500 phone calls from volunteers into the, uh, and 12,000 more paid phone calls by a, a telephone service that does that kind of calling to remind people that they are in favor, remind people that the vote is coming, and remind them to please come and vote. 
and we ended up 53.47. After, as I said, we, we started two points down, 52, uh, 51.49 when we arrived. So we changed the whole metric, uh, and it won. But it took a lot of money, and they got that money, because Go Rail Go was a private 501c4 organization that got funding from a whole host of pro-transit organizations, some with an economic self-interest, people are going to make money building the railroad, and some just with a, a mass transit orientation. Um, but the government, Mayor Mufi couldn't write a check from the city treasury to pay for this campaign. He had to depend on outside private organizations who believed that rail was the right thing for uh, Honolulu. What, what's interesting is Mufi then went on to run for governor, he lost. Um, and the, um, it got taken into court. It's won every court challenge, but it was several court challenges. In the most recent mayor's election, which was two years ago, the former governor of the state ran for mayor and campaigned on a platform saying that even though all this money had been spent, he was going to stop the commuter rail and scrap the whole plan if he got elected. And all of the pro-transit people voted for Mayor Caldwell, who eventually won by a small percentage about 53.47 perhaps, to keep rail, and it's now under construction. But here's, here's another backstory to it. Um, there is a neighborhood in Honolulu called Kaka'ako. It's an old seaport industrial tattoo parlors and you know, uh, run-down uh, uh, industrial spaces, and it's nestled in between Waikiki, which is one of the most expensive pieces of real estate in America with Pravda and Gucci and Tiffany's shopping and very, very expensive condos and hotels. And then the downtown central business district with all of the skyscrapers where all the companies are. So Kaka goes in between. Today, thanks to the rail coming through Kaka, even though it's not open yet, there is $20 billion committed by private companies to building new projects in Kakako on transit-oriented development sites. So it's people who will buy a condo and walk, take the elevator down, and walk across the street and get on the train to go one way or the other in, in Honolulu. And that's the kind of, of miracle economic development that has been created in Honolulu, and the trains aren't even running yet. Is still under construction. Um, as I said, big oil, um, right wingers, anti tax people, taxi limo companies, they were against us. The, all the, the Greens, environmentalists, um, uh, mass transit supporters, um, building trades, they were all with us, but you have to. Even when you have those people who support it, you've got to make sure they show up and vote. If you can have four million people in, in Nashville who believe in mass transit, if they don't participate in the political process, it's worthless to have all those people. You've got to find them, convince them to participate. Um, some quick messages against us. Uh, I won't read them. You, I'll give you a couple of seconds to read them yourself, but you can see the kinds of things that were being thrown at us and the kinds of um, it, messages that we countered with. But again, it's like a political campaign, you know? It's building support. Um, get, identify who's on your side. Start early, the other side gets a head start, they are going to beat your brains in. Poll, understand the language, understand the messaging that will work and won't work, and if it's saying 
uh, homes for average people as opposed to affordable housing, even though it takes more words, that's what you've got to do to motivate people. That's what you've got to do for a message. Um, get good materials out there to educate. Again, you don't want them to be mixed up by the uh, uh, false messages of the opposition or rumors that circulate in the community. Um, get your message out, organize a database with all your people, and then be able to call on them when the time comes. And so that brings us, I'm sorry, uh, um, that brings us to the advocacy pyramid, which we uh, sent a lot of my people to get MBAs uh, along the way. And, and of course, MBAs have to do graphics and, and matrices and stuff, right? And so we, we developed this um, to try to communicate what we do. And what we do is we start with the universe of everybody. That includes mostly unaware. We, we don't care about the universe of opponents. Because once someone has signed a petition to block your project, you're not going to get them to change their mind. So no amount of money or time is going to change their views. They already think you're a, a liar and a, a trying to destroy their life or destroy the world economy or destroy the, the world climate or whatever it is, and they're not going to change. So the universe is all the people who haven't heard of your project or I really don't know much about it, sort of half paid attention. Um, we want to reach them as cheaply as possible. That means social media, it means emails and Facebooks and direct mail to get them to come to the website and look and get start to get educated. Move them up from being totally oblivious to to being undecided, but they, they've heard of it, but I'm not sure how I feel. More information, more time and effort spent with them, and they move to, yeah, yeah, I'm pretty interested in that. Can you send me some more information? Then from there, um, yeah, I'm, I think I, I'll probably support that. I'm not going to do anything about it, but I, I, I know what the issues are. I support, support your side. I, I think it's a good idea. More time and money spent educating and talking with them. And by this time, you've, be, you've, you've identified who they are. You know what their phone number is, their cell phone, their email, and you've got a dialogue going. Now it's no longer cheap um, uh, reaching them with emails. Now it's sending someone to their house to have coffee. And that becomes expensive and time consuming because one person can only meet with so many people at a time. And the, and the last thing you want to do is hold a big meeting. Well, oh, let's have a meeting in the neighborhood and get everybody to come here about the new blank. And what happens is all the people show up are the people who have already decided that they're going to kill your project. And they get everybody in the room to hate you and hate the project before they finish talking. One on one, much better. But it, it takes a commitment of time and resources to go out and reach out to those people. Slowly, you move them to um, openly supportive. They, they're at coffee um, or the Lions Club or whatever it is. They say, yeah, I'm in favor of that. I'm going to vote for it. I think it's a good idea. Let me tell you why. And they throw out three things that they have picked up in your education of them on why it's a good idea. And now they're a public advocate. And finally, we want them to become vocal advocate, someone who will say, what do you want me to say when I come to the city council meeting and give my three-minute speech on why this project should be approved? But it takes an investment of time and effort to get them. Again, as I said, the other side, the, the opponents, they have an economic or an ideological reason to oppose you. They don't need a lot of encouragement. They don't need a lot of education. The other trick is that proponents always have to tell the truth. And opponents can make up the most bizarre lies and exaggerations about how devastating your project's going to be. And they don't have to prove it. You have to prove everything you say. So never say anything that isn't accurate and provable. 
because they'll call you on it and then they'll make the issue that you tried to pull a fast one, that you tried to lie about your project, the issue and not the, the content of the, of the project. Um, so feed the pyramid. Get people in at the bottom and start to move them up. Um, not a lot of money or effort here and lots up here. Um, but you've got to build a base of, of people in your database before you can use that uh, investment of resources and time to its best advantage. Um, once you have uh, start, uh, got their attention, you want to identify and convert them. You want to get a list of 40,000 names of people who say they're supportive of your project and why they are and how you get hold of them, what they said they would do. I'll put up a lawn sign. I'll um, make a phone call. I'll come to a public meeting. I'll write a letter to the editor and then follow through using the, the computer database to make sure that they do what they said they would do to help you. Again, it's all to convince the population first and the, and the elected officials second that there is public will for this project and not just the, the people with a, a economic or ideological reason to oppose it. If they're the only ones who participate, then they're the only voice will be heard. We've got to overwhelm those voices with people who are in support. Uh, and always it's about turnout. If you turn out 300 and they turn out 20, you have a, a distinct advantage. If you turn out 53% on election day and they turn out 47%, you win. You know? it, and it, there may be twice as many people who are really against it, but if they don't show up to vote, their vote doesn't count in the 47% doesn't become 57%, it stays 47%, you win. Um, once you have identified these people, you've got to spend a lot of time hand-holding, educating, encouraging, coaching them. I mean, a lot, the average guy doesn't want to show up at a city council hearing and, and give a speech, right? I mean, I, you know, I, that's not me, I, I don't give speeches. I'm, or, or Tuesday's bowling night, I can't possibly be there at the, at the meeting. I mean, they have a million reasons why they don't want to, to be there and participate, and you've got to coach them to participate. Um, lots of individual contacts means lots of investment in, in uh, uh, time and, and money to, to overcome the passion uh, that the other side will have, that your side won't have, if you're trying to get something built. Um, again, that's just another um, representation of the process that's in your packet, I think. And a few parting thoughts. It's always about <coughs> winning votes. Either it's winning 53-47 in the referendum, or it's winning uh, 21 councillors to, to 19 at Metro. You got to know who your votes are and make sure that they are going to vote your way. Um, it's about process, not the product. Don't get bogged down in a lot of details. Find people, get them to support, and get them to participate. Um, different ca campaigns in different parts of the community. What works in a, the message that you would use in a wealthy um, neighborhood is not the same message that you would use in a uh, poor community that's all renters. It's just not going to work. You've got to have a different message for the different areas that will participate in the process. And you've got to focus those messages in those communities. And, and these days with digital, it's so easy. Um, a few uh, um, things that are uh, um,
tricks that we've, uh, tech, ta uh, tactics, I guess, or tools that we've stolen from political campaigns you may not know of, they're great. Highly recommend them. Telephone town hall and call 20,000 homes in a community at one time. And you call them. They answer the phone. And the, the voice says, in five minutes, there's going to be a telephone town hall about the X project. And Ed Cole, who's the proponent, is going to come on the phone and he's going to explain to you all of the benefits of the project. He's also going to address concerns that we've heard through the community on you know, the traffic at Elm and Main Street and what we're going to do to fix it. So, and we'll let you ask questions. And so people stay on the phone and they listen. And Ed gives his speech. and. Then he says, I know there are people worried about the traffic at that intersection. Let me tell you what we're going to do if we're allowed to proceed. We're going to fix that intersection. Here's how we're going to do it. And then let's take some calls. And we can pass them through. And they can come so everybody on the phone can hear them. Or we can say, well, we've gotten an awful lot of phone calls about um, the air quality uh, in the neighborhood if, we, if this project goes through. Let's just consolidate all those. and, and our expert on air quality happens to be sitting with us. Uh, so uh, Dora, why don't you explain to the, all these people listening? Well, we did this for Steve Wynn on Wynn Casino in Massachusetts. Steve was sitting in his office at the Wynn Tower in Las Vegas. The mayor of Everett, where the casinos hopefully will go, uh, who was on our side, was sitting in his office at City Hall. And we were controlling everything in a different, third location altogether. Steve Wynn stayed on the phone for an hour and 10 minutes talking directly without filter to the people of this community of whom maybe 2,500 were on at the first part of the call. But the, the opponents couldn't call in because it wasn't a, t a radio talk show where they knew a number. You had to, to be us calling you. So there wasn't anybody trying to grandstand. and. The great thing about this technology is during the call you can say, um, now that you've heard Ed talk about the benefits of this for 10 or 15 minutes, are you in favor, against, or undecided? If you're in favor, push 1 on your phone. If you're opposed, push 2. And if, if you're still undecided, push 3. Well, guess what? We called all those people. We know the numbers. So all those people push one, we know who those people are. We can call them up and so we know you're in favor of Ed's plan. Can we get you to sign a petition? Great tool. Um, Micro-targeting, everyone's heard about big data and refining the people uh, through lots of research who is likely to vote for you. And maybe it's the 65-year-old who came from the Northeast who took the rail to, to work and to, to school every day for 40 years. They love rail and they will be supportive even though the demographic is not necessarily supportive. Um, video petitions. Uh, we talked about the difficulty of getting someone to come to a meeting on Tuesday night. It's bowling night or I can't get a babysitter or you know uh, whatever. You say okay. You signed a petition in favor. Let me use my iPhone to record you saying into the camera your name, address, how long you've been here at this address, why you're in favor of the new hospital. We get 30 seconds, a minute and a half. We edit 30 or 40 of these together and it becomes a very powerful tool for several reasons. One is they don't have to come to the meeting. I got them on, on video and I can show it in my PowerPoint. And every city city council will just stare and watch the thing very carefully because they know these people. They may not know them personally, but they know uh, uh, George uh, is always, that guy George, he, he's always three rows behind me at church. Or, or Mary, I, I've seen her at, at Starbucks every Tuesday or whatever. They know these people and they pay attention. Secondly, these people don't have to come to the meeting and have cat calls from their neighbors who are on the other side. Their view gets communicated directly without filter to the, to the politicians and to anybody else that is watching. But they don't have to hear the instant negative feedback from the people on the other side. Third is you can use it in Facebook and 
YouTube accounts and all sorts of different electronically to again demonstrate that there are people out there, just average people, who are in favor of this project. And finally, one of the best things for anybody who's ever collected a petition or a signature on a letter and then it got controversial and someone said, oh, that's not my signature. They can't recant that that's them on the video saying their name and address and why they're in favor of the project. It's a, it's a brilliant tactic, brilliant, ta uh, and it's cheap. It, about, we get about 30% of the people who um, agree to sign a written petition will agree to appear on video. And then we can you know, edit it so we have the single mom followed by the old uh, granddad by, followed by someone else. So it has maximum political power. So those are just some of the tools, but you've got to be constantly stealing the latest uh, political campaign tools and using them because that's how these campaigns are being won today. Anyway, I've spoken too much, too long. Q&A. Uh, huh? we got to have to ask you questions. Okay, well, of course I'm going to let them answer questions. I'll, I'll ask the questions, you answer them. <laughs> questions? Have you worked in any setting where they have term limits, and has that had an effect on the political concern and the issue about electability? Um, not really. I mean, we have worked in some, not a lot of places, but in some. But the, um, the, uh, you have to hit it right, right? I mean, if you hit them one year in their last term, it's a different story than if you hit them uh, one year before their last time go to election. What you don't want is any land use issue to become an issue in the, in the current political campaign. You don't want people uh, uh, going after the incumbent based on their um, vote on your land use issue. I was talking to a state senator from uh, Wisconsin and to show you the, the fear that is out there now, he had been a suburban legislator, a state senator, and he was the last vote in favor of the Milwaukee Brewers Wisconsin Stadium with public money. And um, he was the swing vote. If he had voted no, it would have gone down. He voted yes. Well, I don't know what term limits would have done to him, but in Wisconsin, as you may remember from the Walker battles, there are recall elections, and they recalled him, and he was thrown out of office for voting that way. So you can get them in many ways. Uh, so it, it's still fear. And, and, and frankly, I, I, I've been around this so long, I'm real cynical, and I sound it, and I, I understand. But the, um, there are a lot of public officials who aren't all about themselves and all about getting reelected. But they come down and they react almost the same way. They say, I was elected to serve my people of my neighborhood, and if the people of my neighborhood is demonstrated by the letters to the editor and the lawn signs and everything are against it, then I really owe it to my people not to, to be a good public servant. I've got to, to pay attention to what they are telling me to do. So they're not selfish. They're, they're you know, the opposite, but, they're, but their concern is how do I be a good public servant and the answer is respond to what I perceive to be the will of the people. You said you weren't going to really talk a lot about the local issue that we've got going on now, but uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of, I know, having listened to you, I can see maybe where some mistakes have been made in the administration side of things, and, and um, you know, and it sounds like we really have a long way to go before we really get to uh, actually having to vote as an individual or person on something mm -hmm. because there seems to be a lot of in interference in between. Is that unusual or is this just another way around no, uh, no, it, uh, opposition, I guess? Um, von Clausewitz uh, wrote on war. He was a Prussian general about the time of the Napoleon Wars. And he, he, wrote, a, he wrote a war manual called On War. And if you read it thinking about land use, he gives you great advice. If you're defending 
delay works for your, if, you, if you're in a, a uh, the incumbent, you're delaying, uh, de delay works for you. So delay, delay, delay. And eventually proponents get tired or run out of money and go away. And that's why defenders, no votes in land use fights, are certainly happy with the delay. And anything that they can do to delay the project works in their favor. So um, it's, it, it's uh, I mean, I have seen projects proposed and 12 years later, still in the process. Two or three lawsuits, uh, various political battles and wars, uh, city councils thrown out of office, and then two years later, a whole new group thrown back into office to, to reverse their opinion. I mean, it can take a long, long time. The, uh, I mentioned I was doing a, a 3,500 homes in um, uh, Honolulu uh, for Castle and Cook, and they have been at it for seven or eight years. They had survived two lawsuits by the Sierra Club, and finally they came around to a city council vote. But it was many, many, many redesigns and political fights and, and l lawyer bills um, later that they finally got approved. I mean, they can almost lose, miss the entire cycle of when you know, they would most likely be able to sell those houses based on, on the, the delays. And, but it always works for people who don't want something to delay. Maybe one more, yeah. Um, there's kind of a, it seems like there's a balance sometimes with uh, that out of town expert who comes in um, could be perceived as, as somebody knowledgeable to help your cause, or it could be perceived as somebody from the outside to tell us what to do. Uh, do you see any value in uh, in that expert that may not be a local? Well, it, 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 sure, but um, it depends on what you're using the expert for. A, a, guy, a guy from uh, MIT who comes in and does a, a soil analysis is going to, even though he's from MIT in Boston or Cambridge, is going to have clout because of the reputation of MIT and his PhD in soil analysis. The guy who is local may be just as good, but he doesn't have the cachet in, the, in a situation like that. On the other hand, if you have the local political guy, the local lawyer who's the expert on your side, his agenda may not be the agenda of the project. Um, and we have seen cases where the local lawyer really didn't want to anger a city council friend of his, and so was doing everything he could to slow down the process, which resulted in the process losing eventually. But he, he wasn't trying to kill the project, but he was trying to, his job one was to keep friends with the with the city council. And, um, and that's true of political operatives who live in the community as well. If their next client uh, depends on them being able to produce lunch with the mayor, if they get the mayor angry at them, the mayor's not going to cooperate with that lunch, is he? So that it isn't about helping your project, it's about helping you but making sure that the relationships that he has in place that he, he, he treads on are maintained. So it, it, it differs um, uh, in uh, um, internet. Uh, just one quick thing, I, Ed's anxious to move on. Um, Walmart, one of the reasons Walmart loses all the time or has lost so many, not all the time obviously, um, is that there are a whole thing of things on the internet you can get on how to beat Walmart. Websites that will tell you how to do it, what arguments to use, who the experts are, who will contribute to your, your neighborhood battle to stop the Walmart. Um, all the nasty things that Walmart's ever done or been accused of doing anywhere by anyone at any time are right there for you to print out and run down to City Hall and say, we don't want this company that's been accused of, of child slave labor in China coming to our town. That didn't happen 25 years ago. There was no internet coaching there was no internet research. So if, if uh, Bridgetown moved in for the first time in the community and never heard of Bridgetown, how are you gonna know that they were accused of 
something in, in China. You, don't, you, you wouldn't, but with the internet, you do. And so the opponents now have a wealth of knowledge that they can use to bash incoming projects. I, I just can't say enough, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Listening to Mike and thinking of why we're here, uh, I, I don't know about you, but you go away, part of me is thinking about the, 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 the American democracy, and is this where we are? And uh, part of me is thinking, how can we win when the time comes, given what Mike's saying? Um, another part is uh, the, the, the consistency of the techniques and the, and the, and the way in which uh, projects are, are, are uh, won and lost across the country. Uh, just a very rich resource in, in giving us, in some ways, Mike, insight into ourselves, as, as, as uh, I listen to him. Uh, but just a terrific resource here, and uh, Mike will hang around here for a few minutes. We'll take sure. a quick break, right? Quick break. Do a quick just, break. Just, just one thing, Ed. You didn't tell him that I said the same message four years ago on my first, you that you got to go out and organize if you want your buses approved. And, and any of you involved in the AMP project, we've talked a lot about it, any of us there have watched that project move down the pathway. Because it wasn't where Mike was describing it needed to be four years ago or three years ago. Just a good example of what Mike just said, I had the opportunity last Monday night, week ago Monday night, the night of the Final Four, okay? Final Four, American, this is in the men's basketball, uh, the second one was Tuesday night, but on the night of, of the Final Four, the AARP of Tennessee, uh, had decided to do a telephone town hall on the AMP project. And so their database was limited only to Davidson County. And the calling started, Mayor Dean was the, the, the kickoff person. They started the calling and they had the fascinating screen where you could watch the numbers, the, 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 the metrics of the call. In that, in that little over an hour, the night of the final four, 3,000 people stayed on the line after they got their phone calls. 3,000. And at the end of the call, there were still 800 of them on the line. If you th and that was, a, that was a demographic based on AARP membership. Mm -hmm. I mean, just a fair, that was just a slice of their Davidson County members. Uh, the power of that's incredible, mm -hmm. uh, that interaction that took place. Quite a tour. Thank you, Mike. I'll be out in the hall.